Um, uh, we have uh, uh, everyone here that's participating. I'll go through the members of council in a minute. Uh, and again, if others want to join on the Zoom call, they can go to www.zoomus forward slash my forward slash uh, city of Markham. We have uh, Dr. Kareem Kurji here, who's the medical officer of health. Uh, he is going to be uh, answering some of the questions that you have forwarded and then others can also uh, ask. Uh, but before we do that, um, as you know, uh, in York Region, uh, we've had, had 41 uh, deaths across uh, York Region because of COVID-19. Uh, and here in the city of Markham, uh, we have had uh, 20 deaths and 11 of those have been at the Mark Haven Seniors Long-Term Care Facility. So uh, if we can now just uh, take a moment of silence uh, to recognize those that have passed away and in honor of them. And I know not everyone is going to be able to do this and at the risk of throwing this off, if everyone could make their screen go black, turn off your screen while we have a moment of silence for those that have passed away. Thank you very much. So again, to those across the region, 41 lives that have been lost and uh, 20 lives here in the city of Markham, our condolences go out to all the family and, and friends of, uh, of those victims. And to those uh, who have COVID-19 have tested positive, uh, again, across the region of York, we have 824 cases. Here in, in Markham, we have uh, 212 cases. And just late this afternoon, uh, news broke that uh, there are 37 residents um, at Participation House and 13 staff that make up uh, part of the 215 cases in the city of Markham, and we wish everyone uh, a speedy recovery. Uh, before we start, I also want to take a moment to recognize our healthcare workers, uh, the doctors, the nurses, the PSWs, uh, those that have been providing care, not only at Markham Stovall Hospital, but at Mackenzie Health, South Lake Hospital, all of the long-term care facilities, the group homes, and those that have even been providing health care to, uh, to people at home. I just say thank you very much for your incredible dedication and your commitment to your patients and to, to uh, this community. Um, you have our, our support and uh, thank you so much for everything that, that you have done um, under some incredible uh, set of circumstances. I also want to say thank you to the grocery store and, and pharmacy uh, employees, uh, those that have helped us keep food on the table from the truck drivers to the farmers, uh, thank you. Because um, I got thinking about this on the weekend, not only have we been able to put food on the table, um, but you, know, you really have allowed us to have somewhat of a normal life uh, 
because we were able to perhaps make uh, some food, perhaps have that special dish, dish over this past holiday weekend. Thank you to, to all of the uh, people involved in making sure that we could enjoy uh, somewhat normal lives over this past uh, holiday uh, weekend. And uh, certainly thank you to all the transit drivers, to all the first responders, the people that have been out there making sure that those that uh, need to get to where they need to be, and certainly those that uh, make our community safe are out there doing their work. And I say thank you to all of you. Now, um, I wanted to have this meeting, an opportunity for the community to listen to some of the information that we want to present, but also give you an opportunity to uh, ask some questions and uh, um, thank all of the people that are here. I mentioned Dr. Kurji is here. We'll get to him in just a, a minute or two. Uh, but we also have Andy Taylor, our, our Chief Administrative Officer, is, is with us. And I do want to recognize the members of council that are all he here uh, and uh, hopefully they haven't dropped off with the internet signals, but uh, to uh, Deputy Mayor Don Hamilton, to Regional Councillor Jack Heath, to Regional Councillor Joe Lee, Regional Councillor Jim Jones, Ward 1 Councillor Keith Irish, Ward 2 Councillor Alan Ho, Ward 3 Councillor Reed McAlpine, Ward 4 Councillor Karen Ray, Ward 5 Councillor Andrew Keyes, Ward 6 Councillor Amanda Lucci, Ward 7 Councillor Halid Usman, and Ward 8 Councillor Issa Lee. I thank all members of council for being here. And there's also uh, some members of our senior staff that are here just for uh, the purposes of getting on with some of the uh, information. I'll just uh, say thank you to all the staff, to the people that have been working at the EOC and the people, even our contractors, uh, that have been able to keep essential services going, like our, our waste collection and so on. Uh, thank you to, to all of them. And as I indicated, uh, uh, we are all dealing with this world uh, pandemic, and certainly the crisis has hit home uh, here. And um, I, I want to just reiterate the, the number of cases in York, York Region as of today is 824. Um, the number of people who've passed away in York Region are 41, and uh, the number of people that are in ICU in all of our hospitals, again, Markham Stovall Hospital, Mackenzie Health, and Southlake, uh, there's 20 people that are in ICU across the region of York. And something that you may not realize, uh, half of those people in ICU are at Markham Stovall Hospital. So again, um, sometimes when we see numbers, um, we don't fully under, understand the impact, but there's no doubt we have a hot spot here in, in our community with uh, all the hospitals being challenged uh, with um, the ICU capacity. And, and again, thank you to uh, all of the, the, the doctors and uh, everyone involved. And uh, I just want to say, um, uh, as you know, uh, this afternoon, late this afternoon, um, it was announced that 37 residents at Participation House uh, are te have tested positive for COVID-19, 13 staff. And uh, in the past a few weeks, I know many of you know this too, Mark Haven and Bethany Lodge uh, were also locations where there's been COVID-19 uh, outbreak. And um, unfortunately, at Mark Haven, they've lost uh, 11 uh, residents there. Just want to say thank you to our community for the um, incredible support that you've given, uh, the way that you have been sharing that support publicly and through social media to not only each other, but to everyone in our community. And, and all of your efforts have helped us keep uh, this community uh, united. And I have to say that at the city of Markham and certainly in York Region, um, I thank uh, everyone who has continued to keep our community safe and responding uh, to calls. Now, I just want to give a, a quick little rundown of some of the things that we've done here at the city of Markham. And again, if we could just get the, uh, the slides up, I, I just want to visually show you the progress that we've made. I want to applaud 
uh, our staff at the city of Markham. They uh, had the COVID coordination team that's actually uh, been meeting as a, as a team in uh, January. So they were continuing to monitor some of the activities around the world, starting to think about potentially what uh, we could do here in, in our community to prepare. I don't think anyone ever contemplated the overall impact and how quickly uh, things would change here uh, at home. And so I want to say thank you to uh, our, our uh, staff for beginning to meet in the early part of the new year, uh, starting to think about what they might have to do in preparation for uh, COVID-19 here in our community. Um, we took some swift action on March the 13th. Uh, we closed all of our recreation centers, libraries, and cultural venues. We canceled all of the, our camps and, and drop-in programs, and subsequently have also announced that we have canceled all of the spring uh, programs, and obviously continue to evaluate uh, when we could uh, begin to offer programs back in, in our facilities. And, and again, thank you to all of our, our, our customers, our clients, for understanding the action that, that, that we had to take. At the same time, same time that we closed our community centers, I also announced the Markham Cares Food Drive. Um, and I wanted, right from the onset of this crisis, remind all of us, all of us, that there are vulnerable people in our community. And certainly we saw those images of people lining up at the grocery stores and stocking up on grocery stores and uh, supplies. Uh, and I just want to say thank you uh, to everyone who contributed right from the early days. I've checked in with uh, the Markham Food Bank a couple of times and have to say that they have uh, been uh, overwhelmed with the response. They've been able to keep up with the demand so far. And uh, thank you again to all the individual donations, the money that has been sent in. And today we learned that Electra and the city of Markham is a shareholder of Electra will be donating $30,000 to the Markham Food Bank. So just uh, another good piece of news. I'm not even sure the Markham Food Bank knows that yet, but uh, thank you to Electra. And, and by the way, that's on top of the thousands of masks that they donated last week uh, to many of our hospitals as well. And I know I had some people ask me, why did they wait uh, before they donated those masks? Uh, they had to make sure that they had enough masks for their own personnel. We don't want to put uh, people, particularly the lines people who are out there providing essential service, we don't want to put them at risk. And so we wanted to make sure that they had enough masks. And once we kind of went through the inventory and the calculation of how many we would need, then they were in a position to, in fact, uh, donate, uh, donate um, the uh, mass to uh, the hospitals. On March 17th, in the morning of March 17th, our own, the City of Markham's Emergency Operations Center was activated first thing in the morning. And uh, happy to say that that same day, later that day, the province of Ontario actually declared a state of emergency in the province and our emergency operations center was already up and running. And so again, it speaks to the way that our staff have been watching this whole issue. On the next day, um, on, March the, uh, on March the 18th, um, so you know, thanks to the provincial government for uh, uh, putting forward the state of emergency, it, give, it gave us an opportunity uh, to um, uh, deal with uh, the things that we would have to do in a state of emergency. And the next day, the federal government uh, restricted non-essential travel and announced as well significant financial relief for individuals and also for, uh, for um, businesses. And over the last uh, couple of weeks, we've heard the details uh, of that. And what I would invite you to do, we, we have a lot of links, and rather than 
presenting them here tonight. Anyone who's interested in getting information from the region of York's uh, website on the current status of cases and where we sit, anyone that wants to get information about the type of uh, relief there is from the province of Ontario, and certainly uh, the relief that there is for individuals and for uh, businesses uh, from the federal government, just go to, and uh, please, all of you that are on this, uh, on this meeting, you know, write this down because I want you to pass it on to others in the community. Markham.ca forward slash COVID-19. And I'm just gonna repeat that, Markham, dot ca forward slash covid19 when you go there you will see a chart that actually breaks down the responsibilities of each level of government and under the areas of responsibility all the links that you will need to connect to uh, that level of government and the um, programs that uh, that they are uh, that they are running um, I also called on the provincial government to grant municipalities permission to hold uh, electronic meetings, recognizing because we had to stay apart and we had to stop the spread of COVID-19, I called on the provincial government, to, as others did, to be able to hold uh, electronic meetings. And I want to say thank you to the province for uh, allowing us to do that. On March the 20th, continue to call on the senior levels of government to close non-essential uh, businesses. And back then, although that seems like a lifetime ago, uh, malls were open, people were congregating in public places, non-essential businesses were carrying on uh, their business as if nothing was going on. And so again, uh, I thanked uh, the province for in fact including the non-essential businesses and in the emergency orders and closing those down. And very early on back in March, we began to sign all of our, our playgrounds and, um, and park amenities and asking people to, to not utilize them. Uh, the next day, the, on March 23rd, the provincial government did announce the mandatory shutdown of non-essential businesses. And as promised on March the 24th, and again, I thank the province, we were advocating for this uh, through Electra to reduce the hydro rates, to actually use the off-peak, the weekend off-peak rate. And uh, thanks to Premier Ford uh, for looking at that and actually putting that uh, in place. And also uh, just yesterday, Electra, and we've been working with Electra, and part of the complication is Electra, we have different shareholders. The city of Markham is one of them, but Electra also does our water billing. And uh, we had to kind of get everyone's concurrence on this uh, because uh, the water bill comes through one bill, both the hydro and water. But today it was announced by Electra that we have agreement and effective uh, April the 14th, uh, for 60 days, they will not be charging any late fees on hydro and the water bill. So that was news that we've been working towards, and that has now uh, been announced. On March the 27th, we actually were able to hold our first electronic council meeting. And uh, I have to say, I was very impressed with all members of council because uh, that was the first time we used uh, the Zoom platform to hold uh, that electronic council meeting. Now, as important as that was, because we weren't permitted to do that under the Municipal Act before, really it was the outcome of that meeting uh, that I'm very proud of our council uh, passing. And what we did on March the 27th, we passed, I believe, and I'm still checking daily, but I believe one of the most extensive uh, tax relief programs by a municipality in all of Canada. And what we did, uh, we passed that there will be no late penal penalty charges on unpaid taxes from April the 1st to December 31st. So we wanted to make sure that businesses and people saw a path 
on their property taxes right until uh, the end of the year. Uh, we also waive the stormwater management fee for homes. That's uh, fifty dollars per home, and for businesses, it's actually more because uh, it's based on their um, on their market value. That was also waived uh, for businesses, and we also deferred a 7.8% increase in the water rate until next year. Now we took that move and I wanna thank uh, regional council, uh, which is reflective of the mayor and the regional councillors, along with the mayors and regional councils from other municipalities for supporting that decision because that was also endorsed uh, by the region. So that water uh, rate increase will not happen until uh, 2021. Now, we passed that help for the people in our community that need the help. We are asking those that can pay their property taxes to continue paying, because at the end of the day, at York Region and at the city of Markham, we want to continue to provide the essential services in our community. So we still need police officers, we still need EMS, we still need fire protection in the city of Markham, uh, we still need garbage collection. Uh, we want to make sure that the infrastructure at the region and uh, in the city of Markham are maintained in a state of good repair. Uh, so again, uh, we introduce that help for, for those that, that need the help. Now on April the 1st, we continue to advocate uh, to the province of Ontario to include um, the closure of playgrounds and park amenities because we wanted to make sure that the community would stay away and they were included in the emergency orders. And that meant uh, it really cleared up the ambiguity about those spaces, the charges that could be laid, and there was a consistent approach right across uh, the, um, the province of Ontario. And uh, we do continue to advocate as much as it's been said, it's been advertised, we continue to advocate to get the province of Ontario to include the two meter distancing requirement as part of the emergency orders. Again, so that York Regional Police and other uh, agencies across the province of Ontario have a consistent rule and they can take action. And just in, in closing, I want to say that uh, we do have a, a service update, which we've let residents know about, but we have reinstated yard waste collection, which will start next week in the city of Markham. We had delayed that along with other municipalities, uh, primarily because we wanted to ensure, and our contractors wanted to ensure, that we had uh, staff, uh, there were a lot of concerns with uh, with staff, but also concerned that uh, some of them uh, couldn't come to work because of self-isolation or, or other reasons. And we wanted to make sure that we had enough staff that we were able to first and foremost provide the essential service of blue box collection, green bin collection, and, um, and have that uh, take place as normal. And after reviewing uh, the resources and speaking with our, with our contractor, yard waste will now be uh, included uh, starting uh, next week. And just look at the waste schedule to know which days uh, the yard waste will be collected. But the first week will be next week, the week of April the 20th, and the first day will be uh, April the, uh, the 21st. And then finally, I have to say the experience this past weekend is the third time as mayor uh, in the city of Markham that I've had to actually reach out to the community to try and get personal protection equipment for some of our facilities in Markham. And uh, you know the, the, the crisis at Participation House really highlighted for me that as much as we can do that every time there's a shortage of uh, personal protection equipment, Perhaps it's not the most effective or efficient way to get it out to the organizations in our community that need the equipment. Now, hopefully the situation overall is getting better because we've had more equipment land uh, in Canada, more supplies land in Canada. 
But in the event that any of our, our long-term care facilities or homes like Participation House or Markham Stovall Hospital or uh, Mackenzie Health Hospital run short on supplies, today we opened up the Markham Cares Donation Center. And it's located at 8100 uh, Warden Avenue. It's the building immediately north of the 407. Uh, people, organizations, businesses can donate uh, supplies, personal protection equipment. We will house it there. And then uh, as um, organizations in our community need it, if they begin to run low, uh, we can certainly, they can reach out to us and, and we'll be able to get it to them uh, more effectively. So um, thank you. Uh, it's a sort of a quick rundown of a lot of things that we've been working at over the past uh, few weeks. And again, I want to say thank you to Andy Taylor, to our senior administration at the city of Markham, and indeed everyone who's made everything we've been able to do possible over the last few weeks uh, possible. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Kurji, uh, and I thank you very much, Dr. Kurji, for, for joining us. And uh, I know we say it, we're not going to get tired of saying it. Thank you to you and to the public health staff, because uh, certainly um, your staff have been very busy and working uh, with uh, so many organizations in York Region, and certainly with the province of Ontario, as you are required to do. Uh, but before we get to questions of you, uh, I just thought we'd give you just a, a moment to make some opening remarks and thank you for joining us tonight. Sure. Thank you, uh, Mayor Scapiti, and thank you to the councillors of the city of Markham. Um, so if you were to visit our website, york.ca slash COVID-19, you will see a number of graphs there. And uh, these graphs uh, and the statistics there give us the impression that we are finally uh, getting control of this virus. Uh, having said that, I mean, we still have challenges ahead and uh, three of the institutional outbreaks that we have are in Markham. Our main weapon here is uh, utilizing something called the containment strategy. The containment strategy essentially deals with identifying cases and their, their contacts through a very laborious process and then self-isolating these contexts. And uh, this particular process actually requires a very large complement of folks. Uh, so the public health uh, uh, army, as it were, is made up of over 300 highly professional individuals who are uh, tasked with uh, uh, providing support for this objective. Now, the mayor mentioned participation house. Um, our staff had uh, rushed in uh, PPE, uh, 600, uh, uh, masks and about 500 uh, uh, gowns, uh, amongst other things. And we provided them with uh, education, support, um, and we observed you know, infection control practices in there. Um, uh, we continue to go in into participation house. Uh, today, our folks were back in there, uh, again, uh, providing uh, advice on uh, screening of visitors, uh, essential visitors, that is. Um, and providing disinfection advice as well as infection control and practice advice. Um, we are assisted very much by the efforts of Markham Stovall Hospital here, who have provided not only resources, very, in, very essential resources to staff a participation house during this crisis, uh, but they've also provided clinical expertise with respect to some of the complex problems that exist among the residents there. And they continue to liaise with our paramedics uh, with respect to the areas around providing IV fluids or maybe uh, areas around oxygen therapy. So those particular discussions are going on. Uh, all three of us, uh, Markham Stovall Hospital, ourselves and the paramedic services are working cooperatively here to try and remedy the issues that uh, uh, are so glaring at Participation House. So um, finally, I just want to remind everybody that uh, should you have COVID-19-like symptoms, uh, please make sure that you self-isolate yourselves, uh, make sure that your co close contacts are self-isolated, and then seek assessment and testing at one of the three hospital sites that we have in York Region. Uh, in the past, uh, the, the resources were very constrained, but now they've liberalized testing. 
And therefore, it is my hope that you will not only be assessed, but you will also be tested. Um, it is also important for you to follow the public health guidelines, uh, which are essentially wash your hands frequently, don't touch your face with unwashed hands, make sure that you are keeping your distance of at least two meters when you go out. Don't go out much, just go out for walks perhaps, but make sure you keep your distance. Just go out for essential services. So if you do all these things, um, I think we'll, you'll help us tremendously with being able to get over this particular virus. And I thank all of you for all your assistance. I'll pause here because I think uh, you may very well have questions for the mayor and myself, and we'd be happy to take those questions. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kurji. And uh, I, I wanna thank uh, you particularly uh, you mentioned the help that you gave to Participation House. These are uh, some of the most vulnerable in our community, people who have uh, physical disability, many of them because of cerebral palsy, so they're very vulnerable. Um, and I just want to say as well, just to echo what you said, thanks to you and York Region for getting uh, some supplies there, but also to um, our firefighters, to York Regional Police, to MLSE, to Canadian Tire, uh, to TELUS, uh, to LIUNA, the labor union, to Haley Wickenheiser with, uh, with Conquer COVID-19. Lots of supplies dropped off by individuals and, and corporations. So the response on that front has uh, been overwhelming and they're, they're well stocked. Uh, they're going through a lot of supplies, perhaps at a greater pace than normal because they don't have uh, a full complement of staff yet. And so they're having to change... Uh, their equipment and the fear of cross-contamination. But uh, as we know, um, uh, the, the, the virus has certainly spread even before uh, some of those things uh, happen. So, but thank you to everyone who, who responded. Now, we've got some questions that were sent in prior to, uh, also to our users, and I don't know how familiar everyone is with, uh, with Zoom that has joined us here tonight. But, and depending what device you use, if you're on the computer, you should be able to see a chat. Uh, you can send the chat, a question through chat. Uh, for those of you that are, are on an iPad like I am, uh, there is a, a menu at the top corner of the screen, a drop down menu, and the chat uh, is there. And uh, if you could uh, put your question there, and then uh, we'll try to, uh, oh, Okay, <laughs> uh, I think actually the chat room had to be uh, disabled. So we're gonna go with, uh, with this and then um, uh, we'll try to see if we can engage uh, some of you that are online. But the first question, Dr. Kurji, and actually I think there's been other announcements even in the last couple of days, but uh, Richard Keller asked, there's a test that's supposed to give you results in five minutes, but can only be processed one at a time. Um, he's heard that Amazon will be testing their own people as they uh, ordered it uh, for uh, their own uh, purposes. Uh, the, the question is, how feasible is it to have testing equipment maybe starting in uh, front of malls and perhaps getting people a bracelet or a stamp uh, that they can shop for that day? Is there a plan to test COVID-19 uh, antibodies? So. I think uh, we're just gonna, maybe if you could address any of the tests that have come on into the marketplace and uh, can we get results better? And is there an opportunity to expand testing beyond just the current uh, assessment centers and testing centers that were established by uh, the hospitals in York region? Sure, I want to thank Richard for his question. I mean, he's well ahead, uh, uh, he's, he's well ahead of the times uh, uh, that we're living in at the moment. Whilst uh, there are many, many tests that are being developed just now, uh, we in Canada, you know, are reliant on Health Canada approving these, and in the province, in fact, okaying uh, these particular tests. Right now, our emphasis has really been on getting this virus under control. But as we start entering the recovery period, you will see many of these tests, uh, uh, you know, being adopted. And Richard is quite right with respect to many of the suggestions that he's given and those will be taken into account to see what is feasible. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
And it is great to see, uh, I know one of the Canadian technologies was uh, approved by Health Canada. Another Canadian technology is having a bit of a tougher time, but uh, we understand that it's being used in the United States and in some parts of Europe. So it is wonderful to see at least that, that innovation right here on Canadian soil is uh, being used to fight uh, COVID-19. Um, hands on limb, um, a Twitter question. Uh, York Region posted that, that everyone who has a fever, uh, new or worsening cough or a shortness of breath can visit the COVID-19 assessment centers, um, indicating that this information seems to indicate that the threshold on who can be tested has actually changed from day one. Is that correct? And, and what is the criteria now for someone to go to the assessment center? So, so uh, that is very correct. Um, first of all, you know, the symptoms for COVID-19, as uh, we understand them, have now broadened. It's no longer fever, cough, and shortness of breath, but it may, would include things like sore throat, headaches, uh, runny nose, uh, diarrhea as well. So, and we have listed those on our website. So if anyone has any of those symptoms, we would urge them now to go to an assessment center um, the, there's a lot of cooperation going on between our local partners and us. So the three uh, CEOs of the hospitals and myself, you know, regularly have conversations. And depending on our epidemiology at the region, uh, we suggest that we suggested that maybe the criteria can be loosened for our residents in York region. And so that has been done. So uh, there is a much greater likelihood that uh, an individual would, uh, after assessment, be tested. Okay. Uh, how long, this is from Debashis, and again, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing uh, some of these names or not quite getting some of the handles because there are different names. How long is the wait for people in Markham with symptoms to get tested? And when is the backlog expected to clear? What is the plan for testing everyone, even people without symptoms? Are we ever going to get to that stage? So first of all, uh, the backlog, as you had gathered, as you may have gathered, you know, it was as much as 10,000 tests at one point, uh, but that has been cleared. And in fact, the provincial lab has been working very hard to expand testing. So testing facilities are, uh, so the tests are more readily available per se. Uh, that having been said, um, we still don't have an unlimited amount of testing. And so there is a, a little bit of assessment that goes into, into who, who does get tested. But we would encourage everyone who has COVID-19-like symptoms to go and get assessed and hopefully you'll be tested. Uh, it's important that we do this because we want to make sure that we, we get to all the cases and the contacts in the community. Uh, every case that we prevent, uh, prevents about 100 cases down the road in about a month's time. So very, very important we're gonna recover that everybody avails themselves of the testing that's available. Okay, we're going to give you one more question. Uh, we have more for you, but I just uh, I also have a question for Andy Taylor on uh, small business uh, loans and the support for small business loans. But before I get to that question for him, I'm going to ask you one more. What's the current status of uh, PPE uh, for our doctors and nurses? I'm not sure if you have the answer to that. Before yeah. you get to that answer, I, I do want to indicate and remind people we have started the Markham Cares Donation Center. It's at 8100 uh, Warden Avenue, which is just immediately north of the 407. So we are accepting donations. And uh, just in case any of our organizations in Markham or actually even the neighboring communities do run short for whatever reason, uh, we hopefully can help, help them with the donations that uh, get collected. But Dr. Kerji, do you know the status of PPEs do all the institutions, the hospitals, LTTC, uh, do they have enough of them right now? So to speak to your particular point about donations, we highly, highly encourage you know, folks to donate uh, PPE if they have access to this. Um, very important because, you see, whilst the province has uh, accumulated a fair amount of PPE, uh, they are prioritizing the use. Now, we in uh, York Region would really like to expand the use to anyone who provides any services to seniors. So these would be group homes, like the one that you saw at Participation House, 
we would we would have ideally liked uh, every staff member to be wearing a mask. Uh, this would also apply to lodging homes. It would apply to homes for special care, shelters, and even personal service workers. But but quite honestly, we don't have enough PPE for all that. So at this point in time. We are relying on the government's uh, inventory, but that is restricted for other priority institutions. So the province of Ontario has managed to get uh, more than 13 million uh, surgical and procedural masks, uh, 200,000 N95 respirator masks, and 38 ventilators. And uh, uh, just uh, in the past weekend, they received 6.5 million surgical and procedural masks. Um, however, as I have pointed out, these are for the higher priority settings, such as hospitals and long-term care homes and retirement homes. Uh, they're not necessarily earmarked for the other areas that we would wish to protect. Okay, so um, I'm gonna ask, uh, because we have to shut down the chat room, uh, I, I, I'm actually gonna get you a couple more questions and then we'll just see if there's anyone that's online that wants to ask you a question and um, uh, I hadn't really counted on this, but we might let you go so you can get some rest. And uh, we'll just sort of finish up with a couple more questions for you. And if anybody online wants to ask a question, uh, either do a wave and we'll see if we can get your name. And also, again, if it's your first time uh, with Zoom, you'll have a, a menu that allows you to uh, also put a hand up. But that hand does not stay on the screen um, for very long, so you may have to do it a couple of times before you get noticed. Uh, so before we kind of turn it over to those that are watching, um, and you did talk about masks, so uh, Dr. Kurji, why is York Region not following uh, Dr. Tan's advice, the federal uh, official, uh, to have the general public wear cloth or non-medical masks on top of the uh, recommendation of staying at home and the frequent hand washing and the physical distancing. Um, this will protect others from getting infected. Um, and uh, do is there more uh, knowledge given to us that the virus can be spread as aerosols when people are just talking or, or breathing? So talk about uh, the, the use Sure. So fast, and, and uh, why are you not following the uh, federal official? Thank you. Um, so that's a very good question. And uh, uh, we in Ontario generally uh, align ourselves with what the province uh, uh, decides. And uh, we know that the province is going to be uh, deciding uh, very shortly. We were expecting a decision to be made yesterday, but we are hoping that that particular decision will be made soon. And we will align ourselves with what the province has, uh, is recommending. Okay. Um, so our, do we have, and let me see here if I can catch on some of them ourselves. Is there anyone that, that uh, wishes to ask Dr. Kurji a, uh, a question? And uh, so just because of the way my screen is split up, I'm, I'm going to let uh, Regional Councillor Lee, because I saw your hand go up. Uh, if we could unmute him, and then I'm going to ask the moderator, because I cannot see everyone. If you see uh, someone else, I uh, see uh, Regional Councillor Jones and Councillor Usman, and um, we'll uh, we'll go to those first, and then I'd like to kind of open this up to the public, because. Uh, uh, you know, they're here as well, and we don't always have access. But let's start with Regional Councillor Lee. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Dr. Koji, just my personal question. Uh, normally, I used to have hay fever in the summer and starting in April, right, running nose. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, so far, I have not arrived yet. So, uh, any time we could have first been running nose. So, once that happened, you think I should take the step to go and uh, uh, test for myself? So thank you for raising that question, Councillor Lee. Uh, this is a very important point. Uh, I too actually have those seasonal allergies as well. And uh, I think it would be appropriate for us to start our uh, anti-allergic medications uh, fairly, right now? <laughs> yes, fairly quickly. Uh, because we've had instances, uh, like there was in fact one healthcare worker who apparently you know, had a baseline of uh, suffering from these, uh, what appeared to be allergy symptoms you know, for a long time. And we didn't think that that had increased in any sense. 
Uh, but given that he was, uh, um, you know, could potentially be a risk for others uh, in the setting, we decided to have him tested and, and he turned out to be positive for COVID-19. Oh. So it is extremely difficult for us to distinguish between some of those, uh, those particular seasonal allergy-like symptoms and uh, COVID-19. So you think it was, I should start the medication right away? I think so. I mean, I, I tend to start mine pretty quickly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Regional Councilor Jones. We may just take a second here. Um, Regional Councilor Jones, please unmute yourself. Okay, you okay. can hear me? Hey, yes, yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Jim. Hey, I had a call this afternoon from uh, Suzette Strong, who is the chair of CEO of Markham Stouffville Hospital Foundation. And I had passed information on to you a couple of weeks ago about person with trailers that could be used for uh, uh, patients or, uh, uh, and she was negotiation, she, she was negotiating with the Markham Stouffville Hospital. But at this point in time, Markham Stouffville Hospital doesn't need it. And she asked me if we could get it donated from this Derek, I don't know how to say his last name, and uh, one of his partners, I don't think the partners, they'll try to take the tax breaks and all that, but they also uh, uh, would probably have a financial cost. And uh, when I didn't realize the, the, uh, the seriousness of what was happening at Markham Stouffville Hospital until you mentioned 37 uh, patients tested uh, positive and 13 staff. And I'm saying that's, is that- and that's, I, uh, then, that's our that's participation house, Jim. That's right. Did Those I say, terms. what did I say? You said this, the yeah, hospital, I, that's I was, fine, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I was getting the call from the hospital. And, and Suzette said, if yeah. they have to take these, uh, uh, these uh, patients into the hospital, it'll overrun Markham Stouffville Hospital. And we could put these trailers on the participation hospital or on the participation site and do that. So I'm saying is that if Markham, and I know Markham cares, I'm saying is that, we look at financing this. I talked to Hallett a few hours ago, and between Hallett and myself, we'll try to fundraise, but I think this decision has to be made almost instantly so we can get the trailers on site and get this uh, situation. So I would be, I, this, I can't make a motion, but my recommendation oh. is that we cover it, and then we'll try to fundraise to cover. I don't know how many trailers they need. I think each trailer that's 63 feet long, these are trailers that are used for motion picture when they're doing uh, uh, filming on site, these are used for the actors in that, that they stay in these trailers and they can convert them over to hospitals. There's so 10 or 12 beds in each, each trailer. So my recommendation was uh, maybe seeing if we can financially upfront it and, or, and then see if, what, what we can do in fundraising, but participation house is very poor. So, uh, so okay. I think uh, just uh, if Dr. Kirchy may want to add something, okay. but um, you know um, certainly there there is money, and uh, the premier again today indicated uh, funds to assist uh, long-term care uh, facilities and homes like Participation House. So um, first of all, this is just a, a chat up, a meet up with the mayor. So this isn't a council meeting. So there's no motions uh, here tonight. But also, uh, you know, we'll circle back with uh, Suzette, uh, whatever the accommodation is, whether it's trailers uh, on the participation house uh, parking lot. If it's a question where they're going to have to start moving residents, uh, you know, we could probably accommodate them within the Cornell Community Center. So we'll circle back. But, uh, you know, it's the logistics of how quickly we can set up whatever they need to get set up as quickly as possible. And then the dollars will go, go through the proper channels for, uh, for the dollars. But thank you for that and, and uh, certainly follow up in terms of the accommodation. Uh, so we have uh, Councillor Usman, and then just so you, you know, uh, we have uh, Harry Eaglesham. Um, we also have uh, Peter Miller and Todd uh, Finlinson as well, who want to ask Dr. Kurji a question. And I just saw Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Councillor Colucci 
as well uh, indicate that she wants to speak. But first, Councillor Usman. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think it's wonderful. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think it's wonderful to have this opportunity because I know there are at least 400 people that are involved in watching this, uh, what's happening. And thank you, Dr. Kurji. Uh, my question to you, basically, I think the mayor raised it in the beginning of uh, his uh, presentation. You know, there's a Canadian company by the name of Spartan Bioscience in Ottawa. And they have come up with this uh, machine, a small, it's a small cube that can do the test within 60 minutes. And they're saying in the next phase, it can be 30 minutes. And it's a Canadian company doing Canadian stuff. So my question is, how can we, for your region, put our orders in to get that inventory because they are trying to help Canadians. So or what are the plans for your region to try to get this inventory? And then I'll talk about the item that Jim has raised. So okay. thank you, uh, uh, Councillor, for that particular question. Um, so within Ontario, uh, our testing is mainly done by the public health lab. But in addition to that, there are multiple other labs uh, associated with hospitals uh, who have actually been uh, uh, doing the testing as well. And uh, right now, I am not actually sensing that we necessarily don't have places to send test results to, because right now, um, I think if you look at the capacity that is available, I, I believe it's in the range of around 8,000 and it's growing you know, per day. Uh, and yet the actual tests that are being done is way beyond below that. Uh, so, and the premier is trying very hard to push for that capacity to be fully utilized. So right now the problem doesn't seem to be uh, utilizing the capacity for, uh, sorry, the problem doesn't seem to be not having the capacity, but it's getting people to go to the assessment centers and, and having the assessment centers work at the full capacity. So those are the challenges at the moment. Well, thank you. And on the other issue, I did speak to Regional Council Jim Jones because that was his idea. But I also like what the mayor, had suggest mayor has suggested. I think we have a lot of capacities in the community centers. If we can use that temporarily, that will save us a lot of money. But in case we do decide to rent these uh, trailers, I offered my services to Jim that will help uh, uh, raise the money so that make sure that our community becomes safer, okay. Mr. Mayor. Uh, if I might uh, just add there, um, when it comes to the provision of clinical care, uh, we would be relying on Markham Stouffville Hospital. So uh, we, uh, in, in terms of York Region Public Health, doesn't directly provide the clinical care. Um, so um, I think discussions with Markham Stouffville Hospital are paramount because if they don't require those facilities, then it may not be appropriate to go down that route. Okay, thank you. Yep, so, and uh, Markham Stovall Hospital uh, is definitely in each. Uh, and, uh, certainly they also have uh, toured the Cornell uh, Community Center. So between, um, and, and right now they may be just reviewing their options and wanted to know about the availability of those trailers, but uh, certainly they're well aware of the capacity over at, at Cornell as well. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Harry Eaglesham. Harry, uh, let our moderator find you first and uh, certainly turn on your microphone and you may have to turn it on yourself once he's unmuted you. Ryan, does he have to unmute himself or is he live now? Yeah. Harry? Okay. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Yes, yes. good evening. Uh, Two-part question. The first one is very straightforward. On the York Region uh, website, uh, um, on the list of institutional outbreaks, uh, uh, Sunrise of Unionville is included, but uh, the mayor did not identify it when he identified institutions. And my second uh, Part B question is, um, are we doing any proactive testing in the long-term care uh, facilities? Uh, just thanks. Dr. Kurji, Dr. Kurji, before yeah. you, I just wanted to, maybe you can, if you have the detailed information, 
So Sunrise is on the list, and, and I apologize uh, for missing that one. But it is specific to what is known as uh, uh, the transition beds, and it's a partnership, I believe, with Markham Stovall Hospital. Uh, how much they're segregated from the rest of the facility physically, I don't know, but maybe Dr. Kurji does. So you could address uh, the outbreaks, where they're identified, and uh, particular circumstance if you have additional information on Sunrise. Uh, sure, and uh, uh, thank you, Mayor. You know, it is very difficult to keep up with uh, all the long-term care facilities, uh, as there are some 19 altogether. So with respect to Sunrise, uh, you know, I can tell you that uh, there have been uh, three uh, staff that have been tested and none of them have come back as being uh, positive, although some of the results are still pending. Um, with respect to the residents, uh, we've had uh, four individuals who were ill and two of them were positive. Now, uh, my recollection is that the facility has got some three floors and uh, um, the, the confirmed uh, uh, cases appear to be on the second floor. And uh, I believe that they are generally um, uh, kept different from the other facility. Uh, but uh, these are areas that our staff uh, look very carefully at uh, with respect to the management of this particular facility. I think if I can address your second question about uh, testing uh, individuals, uh, we are aggressively testing the, uh, the, all the residents and staff in the affected areas of an outbreak zone. Um, there is still some debate about testing everybody in the institution. Uh, and uh, basically, if uh, there's an area that there is absolutely no intermingling with, both in terms of staff or residents with other areas, then we tend not to test those. But other areas may be in gray zones, and a lot of thought goes into that. We would like to be testing as many folks as we can, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic so that we get a better handle of the, on the outbreak. Okay, Harry. Thank you. Uh, next is Todd Finlinson, if you're still there. And just give the moderator a chance to scroll down. And Todd, are you there? I am, good evening, Mayor Scarpetti. Are you able to hear me? I hear a bit of an echo, but I do hear you, but go ahead, we, I do hear you. I think we've, uh, I think I've corrected that. We have two uh, lines open in our home. Uh, okay. First, just a, a message of gratitude. I want to, uh, appropriately, all of our frontline workers, healthcare workers and emergency workers are receiving a lot of praise and, and rightly so, and I certainly echo that. But I, uh, I want to express uh, my family's gratitude to all of our elected officials as well at, at all levels of government, uh, the speed at which you know, our country and community has responded to this certainly is pace setting if you look around the world. And frankly, you don't have to look too far to see what ineffective leadership looks like. And I'm not only very proud to be a member of this community specifically, but also Canada uh, and very, feeling very fortunate. So thank you to all the elected officials that are on the, uh, the call here tonight and for putting on this, uh, this great um, hour or so of, of communication. My question is about PPEs. When I ask how we might be able to help, I often hear, gee, do you have any masks and so on? And of course, I, I don't. Um, my question to the doctor is if we were able to donate funds for PPE devices, are they in fact available and can you secure them somewhere? Because on the news, we just often hear that you guys can't get them at any cost and just wondered, is that supply loosening up a little bit? Thank you. Um, Thank you, Tom. So thank you for that question. Unfortunately, the issue isn't so much money, but the issue is being able to source the PPE. Uh, there are various other options that we've been looking at. Our EMS facility, for example, is able to use hydrogen peroxide vapor in terms of uh, sterilizing used PPE, uh, used masks in particular. Uh, however, we haven't yet got the green light uh, with respect to being able to use that reprocessed PPE uh, as yet. Uh, but there may be other, there, may, there are uh, all sorts of options that we are looking at, uh, largely because we just don't have enough. The ones that we really want at this point for us in public health purposes is really surgical masks. 
because we'd like those to be uh, given out to all the group homes. Uh, we also need them to be prepared for an outbreak by having the rest of the PPE as well. Uh, we also want uh, all these homes for special care, lodging homes, shelters, and also personal service workers to have surgical masks. If they're wearing those surgical masks, then they're likely to be protecting the people that they serve, who are mainly seniors, uh, sometimes with quite major challenges. It is so important that we protect these folks because uh, these folks have got huge challenges and those challenges require greater resources should they become sick. And if they were ever to be transferred to a hospital setting, it would drain the hospital of their resources. So it is very, very important just from a selfish reason, from a resource perspective, that we should be protecting them. Not to mention the fact that you know, they are very vulnerable and they are much more likely to succumb to COVID-19. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, just for the moderator, uh, our next question is gonna come from Peter Miller and then uh, Councillor Colucci and then John L. And uh, so we'll go to Peter Miller first. Peter, welcome and uh, your question for Dr. Fergie. Peter? I'm still muted, I think. There, there we go, I hear you. You can hear me? Yes, we can, Peter. Okay, great. Uh, my question is a little different. I live in Swan Lake in Markham, Swan Lake Village. And assuming that we get a solution in the next little while to this, is there a plan to deal with the 1 million citizens in York Region who will be looking to get the first serum? Will it be on the basis of seniors first, or how will that plan play out in the next few months if we get a solution? Uh, thank you for that question, uh, uh, Peter. Um, so a vaccine is not really on the scene as yet. Um, I think the earliest that we'll get a vaccine would be around uh, nine months to a year's time at the very earliest. You know, most people are sort of predicting it'll be beyond a year. Uh, we in York Region have already started amassing uh, supplies of needles and syringes uh, because uh, just as PPE is in short supply now, needles and syringes will go into short supply at that point. Um, now, in terms of prioritization, uh, this hasn't yet been discussed at federal tables uh, that we are aware of, although they must be thinking about it. Um, uh, we would suggest that the vulnerable individuals, so that would involve uh, folks that are uh, over the age of perhaps 60 or maybe uh, 70, depending on the prioritization, would be the first recipients. And then perhaps uh, those individuals with comorbidities as well, those with lowered immune, immune compromising conditions, uh, you know, may also be included in the prioritization. So these things will be worked out in due course uh, with uh, the uh, experts uh, at the federal level and at the provincial level. Okay, Peter, thank you. And uh, please, uh, you know, give our regards to everyone at Swan Lake and, and thank them for adhering to uh, all that we've asked them to do. Uh, it's not easy, uh, I know, but you've got a great community up there, so I know you're supporting each other. Uh, next, we have Councillor Colucci. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm actually uh, speaking on behalf of the residents because uh, he was not able to send messages uh, in the chat room and uh, he asked me to convey this message and uh, basically uh, if uh, the mayor can actually uh, urge the residents to dispose of uh, their gloves and mask uh, appropriately and uh, he noted that he saw there's a lot of uh, masks and gloves are everywhere 
uh, in the town center, like uh, Sunny Supermarket, which is um, 14th and Markham Road area. And uh, he also wanted to know, just from a York Region Public Health perspective, uh, how are we going to, or what can we do uh, to make sure that uh, those areas are being cleaned up properly? Because uh, these, those uh, people, they dispose of the, uh, the gloves and masks inappropriately would also cause uh, the spread of infection. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask a couple of things, Dr. Kerji, to address this. And then I also am going to ask uh, Andy Taylor, our Chief Administrative Officer, to pipe in because we have uh, a set of uh, some communications to certain owners. But I, I do want to say this, uh, just because it sounded like the first direction was to me. Uh, let me tell you, on social media, and we all need to do it, is to tell people... Uh, not to dispose of their gloves and masks. I, it's beyond me how someone could wear a mask and be concerned about health and about the virus and then dispose of this material the way they're doing it. They, they're they worried about one risk and then they create another one. So I see quite a few heads nodding, And uh, but Dr. Kerji, I'll let you uh, address it and then our, our CAO as well. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, you have already uh, tackled a major part of the, uh, the issue. Uh, from our particular perspective, we would urge that folks uh, put it in the normal garbage uh, and make sure that it is secured. So maybe I could probably uh, ask uh, the CAO, Andy, <laughs> at this point. Thanks. Sure. Andy, if you could just tell us, uh, I know that you've been in communication with uh, property owners, because some of this is on private properties and where we become aware if it's in a park or, or a walkway, uh, you know, where there's been a, a dumping of some kind. But uh, I know you're somewhere out there. You're on one of the other screens right now for me, but Mr. Taylor? Thank you, Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, we, through staff, have sent a letter to all the condo corporations, as well as the plaza owners or managers to remind them in very strong language of their duty and civic duty to keep their lots clean, specifically with regards to our latest gloves and masks. It's unacceptable that people are throwing them uh, after grocery shopping onto the, onto, this, onto the plaza lots. So we've issued a letter asking the owners and managers to clean it up daily, uh, the next letter will be hopefully, maybe they put them in a bin if the shoppers do want to discard them, but do it properly. And on the condo side, condo residential condos, we've asked them to ensure their playgrounds, amenities are closed just like the public and keep an eye on the litter. With regards to on the public property, we had an incident uh, just this week at near uh, 16th and Woodbine. Uh, a resident sent a picture to the mayor with uh, showing a whole lot of gloves and masks. So we've sent crews over there to that hot spot and we've cleaned it up. So we will do that. If you have, if you see these hot spots, let us know and we'll get out there. Okay, thank you. And um, I'm gonna just, uh, and, and the moderator and the other individual, uh, if you could just scan uh, one more time uh, we've got John L. who's going to ask a question. We didn't, hadn't planned on doing it this way, uh, but he's got a question for you, Dr. Kerji. I'm going to do one more scan with the screens that we have. If you have a specific question for Dr. Kerji, and since he's gone one sort of rapid fire here, then we'll let him go and we'll address the, uh, the city questions that have been asked of us. Uh, but in the meantime, wave or use your signal and John L go ahead and ask uh, your question of Dr. Kerji. Hello, hi, can you hear me? Go, go ahead. We can, yes, we can hear you. Is a little bit unstable, but uh, hello, Mayor Scarpitti, Dr. Kerji, member of Council City staff. Firstly, just wanted to thank you for your support. 
um, and work throughout the pandemic just to keep everything still running. Uh, I do have two um, independent questions. The first one was uh, that I do notice that people are still um, kind of in groups and they're walking on trails and uh, in the neighborhood. So I was wondering if this was still allowed, as if I recall earlier, the mayor said that all the parks were uh, closed. And if, if, it is, uh, if it is actually closed, uh, who would we call to report uh, the active gatherings? Because um, like I, I was just driving around and I saw, I saw there was a huge collection of just people and cars uh, walking so along. The let, me, let me provide a bit of a clarification and then Dr. Kurji can uh, add to this. Uh, so the five or more people is under the provincial emergency order. And um, so uh, I would just say that if you see that, and unfortunately we can't display it now, but if you email me after, the, uh, after this session is over, and actually if someone could even text it to me, uh, I don't know it off the top of my head, but uh, York Regional Police is the lead agency in York Region to uh, ticket people. Our bylaw officers, our parking control officers, our park staff, our road staff, even our firefighters when you're coming back uh, from a call. Yeah, any of our staff witness uh, five or more people, they will address the individuals and if they cooperate, uh, wonderful and most have. Uh, but if they don't, uh, York Regional Police uh, will be called and uh, they will uh, ticket uh, because especially if our staff have been engaged because the education part hasn't worked. Uh, but we do have a number that you can call and here's the clarification. The playgrounds, the park amenities like the tennis courts, the off-leash uh, dog parks, those are our, the basketball courts. They are closed under the emergency order in terms of a park and being able to go out and walk in an open space, uh, definitely uh, you can do that. Uh, obviously, practicing the physical distancing and obviously not with a group of five or more people. Uh, so just to provide the clarification, because we actually do want people uh, where possible to go outside and enjoy uh, whatever type of weather you like, whether it was yesterday's weather or beautiful weather and uh, get outside and enjoy it. It's good for you, it's good for mental health, uh, but the, the rules must be, uh, must be followed. The only difference uh, on the, some of the open spaces is York Regional Forests have been closed and the trails within York Regional Forests have been closed, but a place like Milne Conservation Area and our multi-use pathway systems are, are available but again, you have to practice uh, the orders and the recommendations that have been given. Uh, Dr. Kerji, did you want to add anything else to that? Uh, no, I think you've covered everything, Mayor. Um, the only thing I'd add is that I do know that the York Region Police have issued tickets in Markham. So uh, it is happening. Uh, but uh, in keeping with our desire, really, to use persuasion, educational approaches, rather than you know, um, sort of harder approaches, uh, we, we prefer people to uh, do their own civic duty and assist us in this. Um, you know, this is not an area that we would want to push a lot of resources in at this time when resources are needed elsewhere. Thank you. So I, I think we've closed the chat uh, in terms of people contributing, but I believe the York, uh, the YRP non-emergency line, if you open up the chat, it's been provided for uh, in there, okay? And John L., uh, we were kind of letting one question. Is your second question for Dr. Kerji or for? Uh, I'm actually, it's actually a, a question about small businesses. So I'm not sure. Uh, who can, we, uh, can we wait? Because we want to get uh, a couple more questions to Dr. Kerji and then we'll come back to you. I won't forget you. Of course. If there's time, I'll ask the second question. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Issa Lee for Dr. Kerji. Uh, hang on, Councillor Lee. Uh, 
maybe just try your mute button because I think we, there you go. Go ahead, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Dr. Kirji, for um, well, having this wonderful session. I, I have one question with regards to um, the participation house um, situation. Um, actually, uh, we have been having a meeting um, yesterday uh, with our accessibility committee um, in an in informal Zoom meeting, um, uh, particularly on this issue. Um, because one of our members are actually um, uh, being, um, well, actually left the participation house and, and uh, she's uh, actually staying home. But then uh, we were actually concerned about her situation and her mother's situation because um, um, they, um, the daughter was the rest, uh, was a resident of participation house. But then after they, uh, they are, uh, she is moved um, back home and seems there is no more like follow up and, um, um, testing for her um, because um, actually they were they were actually moved out because of the outbreak and then after a few days um, the daughter had some uh, COVID-19 symptoms um, actually we were actually discussing uh, discussing some of the uh, uh, some of the questions one of them was if there is any in-house testing available for uh, people particularly uh, with disabilities um, this is one of the major things we have discussed and we would like to ask. Mm -hmm. Any further uh, assistance from the York region that we can provide? Sure. So thank you very much for that. Uh, what I would urge you to do is to call our offices. You know, we have the health connection line uh, and uh, um, you, 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 they will then direct you appropriately. Uh, we do have, uh, um, you know, we don't advertise this because uh, uh, it's very resource intensive. Uh, uh, Dr. Kirji, you are advertising it now, so <laughs> if, it's something, if it's something you want to direct to directly to Councillor Lee, what we'll do is provide you her email and you sure. can give her the details because sure. uh, there's... The, on the other hand, if she connects uh, with Health Connection, sorry, with our lines, okay. uh, she'll yeah. be directed appropriately. So, but there are ways for doing that. I didn't want to stop you, but if it's no, 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 I, I think you're right because uh, you know we don't want to advertise it very uh, broadly because we don't have the resources to be able to manage that otherwise. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question for you, Dr. Kurji, is from Sergeet Sajdev, and Sergeet, um, I'll just let the moderator find you here on the list and open your microphone, and then you might have to hit your your icon as well. Uh, Thank you. Can you hear me, Mr. Mayor? Yes, welcome. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate this um, uh, chat that you're having with the residents. My question is because I have a child, a son who is developmentally challenged and the participation house is where he attended the program for a few weeks many years ago. So this is really uh, goes to the heart of our family. And then my question is uh, for Dr. Kurji is, Moving forward, what sort of preventative measures uh, or regulations will be instituted to prevent such outbreaks in facilities that house the, 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 the vulnerable? And that includes the uh, persons with disabilities because you know we have been speaking about seniors which they deserve the attention. But as you know, the people with disabilities represent approximately 20% of the population over age 15, as Stats Canada 2017 has mentioned. And we haven't really heard much of that. And I'd like you to address that, please. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, uh, what we did was uh, we uh, ensured that we pushed out a lot of educational material and we tried to educate as many, many group homes and other facilities, in addition to the long-term care institutions. Uh, we also... Um, uh, we, you know, we, we also have moved to requiring uh, the workers to be wearing masks because this would actually both protect the, the, the residents as well as the workers. Uh, that having been said, um, it is extremely difficult to prevent the COVID-19 virus from getting into long-term care homes. And long-term care homes, as opposed to group homes, uh, have got far more stringent uh, uh, you know, measures in place. Um, it, not only that, but they have been accustomed to having such outbreaks. And so they're very skilled at being able to prevent these. Even then, we are finding that COVID-19 has somehow managed to get behind these defenses and get in there. So I think it's going to be a very challenging uh, uh, thing 
to be able to prevent COVID-19 outbreaks unless we actually get the whole community to be free of COVID-19. And that is our aim. Uh, that is why we are dedicating so much by way of our resources to contact tracing and making sure that we burn out this virus in the community. Thanks. Okay. Uh, with that, and I apologize if there were any others that needed to ask the question of Dr. Kerji. Um, it, it, I, as I said, we didn't plan it this way, but uh, once we opened up the floor, there's been uh, questions of you aside from the ones that were set in uh, in advance. Um, I think I speak for everyone in the room and for those that are listening uh, as well through Facebook and, and Twitter. Thank you to you, to your team. And um, these are challenging times. And uh, uh, once this is all over, and this just doesn't pertain to you, it pertains to officials at all three levels of government, uh, we're going to have to have one big Zoom event to deal with the big debrief that has to happen after this is all over. Uh, like every situation we learn, and I hope that we take what we learn today and over the next couple of weeks and better position ourselves for the future. But in the meantime, um, uh, well, I'm hosting this, so I'm gonna let you go so you can get mm -hmm. some sleep. I hope that's okay with everyone. And if anyone does have uh, any other questions of, of Dr. Kerji, uh, by all means, you can email me. Oh, Councillor Ho, I'll let you have one question. I just saw your hand go up, and then I'm going to let Dr. Kurji go. In the meantime, though, because uh, we were asked about the uh, non-emergency phone number, and thank you uh, to a couple of people who texted to me. Uh, it's 1-866-8666. Two, three. And I'll repeat that one more time. one 866 And I'm glad that Dr. Kerji made everyone aware that YRP has in fact given people a uh, summons and they will continue to do that because I think people have uh, seen um, the... Um, the uh, impact now that this is having on healthcare workers and those vulnerable in our, in our community. So two more questions. One's from Councillor Ho, and then one is from uh, Michelle, and uh, she is a, a member of our youth here in the city of Markham. So in, in a bit of fairness of time, we're gonna let her ask the question, but first Councillor Ho, and then we'll get to her. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, well, uh, my question for uh, Dr. Kuji is, there are so many types of protective gears, for example, like uh, face mask, uh, goggle, even uh, down to, you know, uh, shoe cover, uh, gun, shoes. And I have a lot of organizations and individuals who would like to donate to participation house alone. So what kind of, you know, uh, uh, this, kind, uh, this type of protection uh, gear would be the most suitable one, you know, for this organization. Uh, thank you for that uh, offer uh, of help. Uh, I would say all of that is in short supply. Um, in fact, uh, you know, the gowns and the goggles, uh, all that is also very much in short supply. Um, not only just the surgical masks, which we find to be perhaps the most useful, but when we're looking at protective equipment, all of that is in short supply. And uh, I would suggest uh, the mayor may, I, I think the mayor made reference to the facility where these could be potentially be dropped off. Uh, but I'm sure the mayor would be happy to facilitate uh, any donations. Absolutely. So once again, not only, uh, you know, in dealing with this question, but members of council, the community that's uh, joined us here tonight, those that are listening in through Facebook and, and Twitter. Uh, if you have any uh, personal protective equipment, it can be the N95 masks, it can be the surgical masks, it can be any kind of mask, uh, protective eyewear, face shields, gowns, uh, booties, uh, gloves, uh, we'll accept that, and, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, Councillor Ho, I know at, at certain points over the last few weeks, 
um, organizations have said, just give us anything. It's better than nothing. And sometimes they'll combine, if they don't have an N95 mask, they'll combine a mask with a face shield. So we'll, we'll take anything that we can at the donation center. And then obviously let organizations in our community know what we have. And I know in some cases, even a couple of weeks ago, Markham Stovall Hospital was getting desperately low and they just took uh, uh, sort of the plain mass just in an effort to provide some protection. And then sometimes it's not for the frontline healthcare providers that are actually dealing directly with the patients that have COVID-19. It's others within the hospital community or within the uh, center that isn't dealing with people directly, but still requires some level of protection. So we'll take it all and as needed, we'll get it out to the organizations. So thank you for your question. And, and I know that you've already facilitated it as others have donations to some of these organizations. So um, do we have moderator? Do you know where um, Michelle is? And are you able to turn on her microphone? Uh, hello? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, hi, my name is Ishil Shakir. Uh, first, I just want to thank you guys for hosting the Zoom meeting. It's very informative. Um, I wanted to ask, can you have COVID-19 and show no symptoms? Because I know it depends on your immune system and it takes a long, it doesn't just happen instantly sometimes. So is that possible? Uh, yes, it is, unfortunately. Uh, in fact, one of the residents who passed away at Mark Haven uh, had no symptoms at all. And we didn't really suspect that the individual died of COVID-19 until after we got the swab results post-mortem. So unfortunately, it is possible, although uh, we suspect that it doesn't happen in too many individuals. Thank you. All right, Dr. Kerji, thank you. And we're going to get on to some of the city questions. Again, it was not by design, but you're a popular guy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mayor, and thank you to members of the Council. Take care. Thank you. Thank you Appreciate Mayor. you being with us tonight. And we are going to deal with the other questions that have come in for uh, us or potentially other levels of, uh, of government. Um, the first one is, uh, and I think, uh, I'm not sure if Andy Taylor can address this one, uh, but here's the question. For the $40,000 small business loan for COVID-19, the only criteria is that the business or organization uh, had to have spent at least 50,000 in payroll in 2019. This requirement is very high for small business uh, that don't have, uh, that threshold is very high for uh, some of the businesses that might require a loan uh, because they, some of those businesses don't have that many employees or the owner and sometimes family and others are, are running it. They also uh, do income tax um, and pay the rent, which is a couple of thousand every month to the landlord. So since we couldn't open uh, or we can't open and have an income and also can't apply for the $40,000 loan, uh, I'm asking, could you suggest to the government to lower the minimum requirement this is very important for all those small businesses that don't have employees and uh, just the owner is, is running the business. Um, so I hope that you can help those small businesses to keep running and, and not to go uh, out, of, uh, out of business. Now, Andy, did you want to address this? Um, yes, it is a, more for the federal government and, and uh, I'd like uh, my office staff, because I know that they are listening in, um, to take this and also forward this to our local uh, uh, MPs and, and uh, you know, we might be able to do this again and, and engage them as well, but uh, definitely maybe you could just take a crack at it and then uh, we'll get to some of the other ones. Thank you, Mayor. Many of our clients we work with through this Markham Small Business Center, which is, uh, you can go to their website, 
have these type of owner manager situations where their payroll is less than 50 K. So they don't meet the threshold yet. They're in a tough situation. They also have fixed overhead costs. The good news is the federal government has, has rolled out a lot of programs recently and they have changed the eligibility requirements as they've moved forward. So the feds have released programs just recently and as they move forward and connect with their clients and get the feedback, they have changed thresholds. So that's promising. Just to give you a little bit of information, the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses is advocating the following. They want to make the $40,000 loans more accessible, eliminate the payroll test to allow more businesses to participate and make the $10,000 forgivable a simple grant to help pay for fixed costs like rent. So the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses is advocating on your behalf to lower the threshold. Our staff supports them and definitely the mayor's office will uh, write a letter to the federal government in support of the uh, Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses because these are tough times for the small businesses. That is a certainty. So um, we were all dealing with uh, the crisis that was happening at, and still is at Participation House. Uh, but on Saturday, um, I think once the program was approved to, uh, uh, with the Parliament having the debate, there was also, um, I think at least for the first month, maybe two, but I, I think it does apply for the first month. If I read it correctly, there was a, a lessening of the threshold so that didn't, you didn't have to have a, a 30% loss uh, year over year. Um, the threshold was, was uh, lowered. And uh, again, if you go to markham.ca uh, forward slash COVID-19, when you go there, you will see the different levels of government, who's responsible for what, and all the uh, appropriate uh, links. So thank you. And I should find out who did ask that question. But thank you to uh, to uh, the person that, that asked that question. And uh, I apologize, I don't have it right handy, but uh, you probably know who you are. The next one deals with landlord and, and tenants. And again, this may be one that we need to pass on to uh, the provincial government. But if tenants receive the C, uh, CERB or EI and still don't pay the rent, how would the tenants be accountable as they cannot be evicted at this time due to non-payment? Uh, uh, landlords have been given a provision to defer the mortgage payment, but there are two issues with that. Firstly, not all banks are abiding by this rule. Uh, again, uh, this is from uh, Kamal. Uh, Sahani and Kamal, what we'll do is uh, forward this on to our, uh, our local uh, MPs uh, so that if you could provide us which banks are not adhering to that, we could certainly pass that on. And then secondly, the other issue is uh, the landlord send, uh, send up paying significantly more uh, because they've been deferred and stand to lose uh, either way. And is there a provision for both landlords that both landlords can be exempted as well from the tenants uh, could be exempted from paying their mortgage? So this really is a, a federal government one. Uh, but Mr. Taylor, if you wanted to pitch in, you, you certainly can. I agree with you, Mayor. We'll pass this along. I think the Premier did say on the rent uh, tenants and landlords, he urged tenants to have the money pay. This isn't a free ride. This is for people in need, just like the city's programs are people that need the assistance. So there is a bit of trust and an honor system here. In the short term, I'm sure if there are, if this continues, the Premier may have to modify the, uh, the eviction uh, notices, agreements, and, and come up with another strategy. But the clear message is, if you have the money to pay your rent, if you have your money to pay your taxes, pay them. These programs, whether at the federal, municipal, or, or provincial, are for those who are in need, 
who have lost their job in our in dire situations. So we'll hey, thank you. And we'll get that to, uh, to uh, the, the federal uh, MPs as well. Uh, this question comes from Robin, Robin Stewart. Most communication is done over the internet, but a lot of people still in this day and age do not have internet access. And in particular with business closures, uh, employee finances are tight with respect to phone data plans. Is it possible for Markham to designate a Wi-Fi area so they can participate in such events? Uh, I guess like the one that we're holding tonight uh, or in medical or political updates regarding COVID-19. Thank you, Mayor. There is free Wi-Fi available across Markham in many different locations and hotspots, and they're identified on the internet. Currently, outdoor Wi-Fi access points are available outside city facilities. These are our community centers, including the Ani Center, community center parking lot, and at the Markham Civic Center in the Lower Pond Ice Rink area. So any of our civic uh, facilities, our community centers have public Wi-Fi out, outside the facilities. And you're welcome to use it, provided <laughs> you maintain the physical distancing and public gathering requirements are adhered to. So I just want to make that caveat. The City of Markham, you asked about COVID-19, is communicating information on COVID-19 daily through several channels, including radio, mobile signs, electronic signs, and social media. So we're trying our best to get the message out. But we're all always open for uh, new ideas, and hopefully the citizens themselves will push information, credible information, out through their social media uh, channels also. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad you said that, because I was going to add that, no matter what you do, uh, you still got to adhere to all the uh, all the requirements. Uh, the next one comes from Lance Gao, and Lance asks, uh, I contacted City Property Tax Department uh, to defer payment uh, or for the defer payment issue. Staff told me what defer payment will do is only uh, no penalty or interest till the end of December. But by then, you have to make full payment of the previous months uh, at once. This type of defer payment doesn't help us that much. Uh, we don't have income until then, and we cannot afford uh, uh, this type of, uh, of payment. Um, can we pay all property taxes? Uh, if we cannot pay all the property taxes at once in December, uh, can we defer like the mortgage, like the banks are doing for mortgages? Uh, they don't ask for uh, deferred payments all at once. Time uh, mortgage payers only need to pay month by month, just like before. Uh, anyways, well, it's, it's essentially really kind of saying what else can we do? Uh, uh, you can certainly add to this. I want to stress that this relief uh, was something that uh, we did as a municipality so that people had uh, certainly clarity about what was going to be required for the remainder of the year if people needed the financial uh, assistance. So there will be no late payment fees uh, between April the 1st and December 31st. Um, I know in the beginning I, I, I spoke to the fact that we had asked uh, the province of Ontario, I'd written the Premier about a week and a half prior to the economic, economic statement uh, saying, can we get a deferral? Because we also collect property taxes for education, but we don't keep that money. That money gets transferred to uh, the province of Ontario, but we asked uh, a deferral of that transfer. And they agreed to two, they have not agreed to the final one. So we provided as much relief as we could uh, and to say that it is the most extensive than any municipality. There's now a couple of municipalities that have emulated our plan, but when you take a look at everything uh, that we're doing, including the elimination of the stormwater management fee uh, to businesses as well, we also took away, it's a, it really impacts a small segment of business, but an important segment. We also eliminated the uh, municipal accommodation tax for 
for hotels. We're trying to stall and do things that give hopefully people a chance to begin uh, the financial recovery in the latter part of, of the year. And that's why we kind of set that ramp in, until the end of the year. Now, if there is further accommodation uh, by the province of Ontario for us to even uh, further push out the payments that we have to make to them for the education taxes, well, uh, you know, and I, I see a lot of the councillors right now, I don't see them all because I see other people on my screen, but I would hope that our council, if we got further relief from the province of Ontario on transferring the education taxes, then, you know, would have that ripple effect where we could then do more at, at the local level. But we're having to hand over money to the province for education with uh, some deferral, but not till the end of the year, I can tell you that. There's payments that we'll have to make between now and the end of the year. And the same with the region. There is a report going to regional council this Thursday. Uh, the recommendation right now as it sits is uh, a 90 day deferral of the payments that we have to make to the region. And they'll start charging the city of Markham interest after the 90 days. Now, I'm going to speak to that recommendation. I think they almost have it right. Uh, I've made it very clear at our last regional council meeting, uh, because we recognize at the regional level, they also have to keep essential services going. We want police, we want the EMS, we need transit still for healthcare workers. Uh, a lot of the public health uh, that we just had Dr. Kurji on, all of that has to keep going. So. Our, my commitment on behalf of the city, and I, I did it with the comfort of the support of the members of council, is that we'll pay the region as the money is there and available. Now, um, deferring it for 90 days helps us, uh, but to be honest with you, uh, we'll pay, but if there is a gap between now and the end of the year, I'm gonna try to get that, that recommendation changed slightly, that we pay when we receive it, but that we not be charged interest until the end of the year so that we can keep our program intact for the residents and the businesses in the city of Markham. But I want to take up too much time tonight, but that's, uh, that's kind of where I'm going with it on, on Thursday morning. And uh, I know probably some of the regional staff are still listening. So maybe they got a bit of a heads up by being a part of this event. But thanks for the thumbs up, Don Hamilton and a few others. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll do that or try to do that on Thursday. But Andy, did you want to speak to anything? I think the other thing I just want to say before the CAO speaks is our basic revenue for the city, uh, as it is for York Region, is property taxes. We don't have tools like even the city of Toronto does, like land transfer tax and the ability to tax some other things. Uh, we don't have those tools, so primarily, our revenue comes from property taxes, and we've put this program in place really to help those that, that uh, need the help. So, uh, Mr. Taylor. Quickly, you've said a lot, Mayor, there. Uh, I think we all agree these are very difficult times for families and businesses right now, and Markham Council is committed to doing what we can to assist, and the Mayor went through a litany of some of the things we've done. But just to get to the... Uh, the Lance's uh, question, if December 31st comes and you can't pay your taxes um, and require additional flexibility, please come in and speak to our tax office and we will work on with you a repayment plan, a program, so we could stretch it out if we had to and if you are in need. December 31st comes, come to the tax office and let us work with you on a more flexible repayment plan. And I know we'll have some further discussion, but uh, um, again, happy to deal with it uh, with uh, emails and perhaps some more information on, on social media. media. Next question, uh, Mr. Taylor, is large cities in Canada, such as Vancouver, have warned about the impact of their financial condition due to potential decline in revenues, uh, like property taxes and among other things, and uh, increased operating expenses for COVID-19. 
what is the projection for the city of Markham and what are possible measures to, to mitigate that financial uh, impact? Uh, thank you, Mayor. As you mentioned, like unlike other levels of government, municipalities like Markham are not allowed currently to run operating deficits. So we have to balance our budget every year. That's how we in all municipalities in Ontario operate. And we do have prided ourselves in the past on being very uh, prudent fiscally and financially and operationally. Very effective. However, these are challenging times. We will have cash flow issues. We will have a budget to deal with and staff are looking at all kinds of strategies, both short-term, mid-term and long-term, uh, looking at the type of recovery it will be. It won't be an on-off type recovery. So we recognize that. We're recognizing that if it is a slower recovery due to the physical distancing rules that may apply both for our customers as well as staff, we're looking at the impacts of that. We'll, we will be reporting, we have did an initial report to council, but we'll be reporting monthly to council on the outlook fiscally, because we have to keep our eye on it. It's the most important thing after the health, obviously, of our citizens that we have to deal with and understand, come to grips with, and come up with strategies of how to make our city sustainable short term and the long term. So we'll be reporting out to council monthly. We'll be bringing a report April 20th, this Monday, to council, giving an outlook of what we know now. And again, I want to stress no one has a crystal ball. We're going to present options and scenarios of what may be in front of us. We have some known knowns. Obviously, our community centers are shut down. That's a known known. We have deferred taxes, uh, penalty and interest, and water rate increases. So we do have some known knowns, but we're going to be working with the uh, unknowns and try to look at options, strategies to give council an idea of some of the we'll have to grapple with in the coming weeks and months. Okay, and uh, again from um, from uh, Casey Chan, a question on the Celebrate Markham grants, and I'll just say that uh, again, you're going to be bringing reports. These are grants that are given to community groups for various celebrations, mm -hmm. and um, there's been no decisions yet. I know that the overall program, there may be a reduction only because these events are not taking place. But I, I know there's been some contemplation of perhaps giving some money uh, to help facilitate uh, virtual uh, events. But it certainly wouldn't be at the same level because groups are, are not going to be incurring the same costs to put on uh, the actual events. And I know a question about seniors, the, uh, the seniors funding uh, that the city gives. Uh, again, this will be an ongoing discussion with different groups. Uh, I know all of the organizations do an amazing job of supporting seniors. And uh, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the activities that you've had to organize, again, cannot happen due to the restrictions. So this is something we'll continue to watch. And obviously, we want to be able to continue to support organizations to put things on. But if the restrictions don't allow us to do it, I think other taxpayers would also want to make sure that we're uh, not giving out money to organizations when in fact there's been no event that they've had to host and or some of the programs that they've had to run but it's an ongoing evaluation and i think i'll leave it at that unless mr cao you've got something you want to pipe in on on that one we're bringing uh, a we're bringing a preliminary presentation on april 21st which is next tuesday giving council an opportunity to look at a framework on what we do with events that are canceled, go virtual, are not happening, but they have sunk costs. May I think it's- May be rescheduled and they may be smaller. So we're gonna give a framework for council to consider of how to deal with it on Tuesday. Is it Tuesday or Monday with general committee? Tuesday at Development Services. Okay, so you're doing that at Development Services, okay. And then the, uh, that's I guess in specific to that one. 
Um, I think, Mike, uh, thank you. you. You've asked about cost-cutting uh, measures, improvements to the city to reduce the negative impact of COVID-19 and um, uh, trying to avoid inevitable uh, tax increase or user fee increases in the coming years uh, to recover. So I think uh, Mr. Taylor has answered that one. Uh, it's ongoing. They'll continue to evaluate programs. Uh, right now, um, uh, as you know, our community centers are, are closed. And uh, even though, for example, we've eliminated the stormwater management fee, uh, we're currently going ahead with the projects that were planned this year uh, with that program. So uh, some things will continue on because they're capital projects and they're funded over many years. And there may be uh, other projects or programs that get modified and trying to come to grips with the additional costs that we have with COVID-19. And certainly um, uh, we'll continue to uh, work with the other levels of government to potentially get financial support, although they've been quite ambitious as others have recognized tonight in their support of families and their support of small businesses. So I don't know where municipalities are going to end up on that list after everything is, is over. This one comes from Barb and uh, Norm Pemberton. Um, uh, could one of the way signs be placed around Too Good Pond to ensure uh, social distancing? Uh, when walking through the longest footbridges at the south and north end of the pond, it's a beautiful walk and it would make it safer for all. So as much as our parks and open spaces have been open, I guess the question is, could we do a bit more in some key areas to promote social distancing where it's a challenge? So whether we just remind people that they do their best in those places, but uh, just bump that up. And then the other one, uh, what are the social distancing rules in Walmart and Markville Mall? Um, hesitant to enter as well, uh, other grocery stores. So on that one, before we get to the, this, the signage, uh, many grocery stores have limited the number of people uh, that they're allowing inside in an effort to minimize and to try to adhere as much as possible to the social distancing. I have had pictures though, where in, some, in front of some of these establishments, people are congregating. So it's kind of goes contrary to the efforts the grocery store is undertaking on the inside. So again, a reminder for everyone to, uh, to do that. And the, the question was, uh, who do we call? Uh, I gave out the number and I'll repeat it one more time. Uh, it's 1-866-876. 5423 and we will put that up again through social media uh, as well. So do you want to deal with uh, some of the signage issues in some of the uh, areas where it becomes a challenge, uh, Mr. Taylor? Yeah. Sure, Mr. Mayor. At this time, like a lot of municipalities, we're counting on our residents to do the right thing and remember that they are part of the solution to breaking the chain of transmission and should be practicing physically distancing themselves. Installing signs and creating a one-way situation isn't a simple task and further it sets up more work to monitor and ensure signs are in, are in place. So currently we're not looking at this. However, if things change in the future, it's obviously an option. So our park staff are out there with our bylaws. We'll have more park staff coming on in the summer. So there'll be more people in the parks able to monitor and to remind people. So hopefully that will help, but currently we aren't looking at extra signage to the extent uh, we're being asked to do on the trails. We're hoping the existing signage is enough. Okay, um, so the I'm just gonna mention about uh, four uh, different people here and um, Interesting handles, I'll say, but uh, <laughs> so we have different handles, everything from QT Pants on Twitter, Erica Missio on Twitter, uh, Hottest underscore Toronto on Twitter, and David LaPena, all kind of asking a question related to uh, parks and what's open and what can I use and can I use the trails. 
So, and they touch on different aspects. So to be clear, playgrounds, tennis courts, off-leash dog parks, benches, um, uh, basketball courts, those park amenities are closed. They're closed under provincial order and you can be fined and, and char or charged uh, if you go into those areas. The open parks, you can go there with people that you live with. So if you are living in the same household, yes, you can go for a walk. Yes, you can use a trail system. You can use the multi-use pathway system, but you cannot do that with someone you don't live with, and you certainly can't do it in a group of five or more. That is not uh, permitted. So you can use the trail near Milne. You can use the multi-use uh, pathway system. Again, you can be out with the people that you live with, uh, but you cannot engage in activities with others and you do have to keep your social distance from others when you're out uh, in these areas. Uh, Mr. CAO, is there anything else you wanted to cover on that score? That was a good summary, Mayor. I just uh, also let you know that Markham worked closely with the, both the public and Catholic school boards and uh, all mm -hmm. their basketball nets are down as well. So school grounds are closed and off limits also. Okay, uh, uh, so this one is, I think, for me, uh, although uh, there may be others that are on the call uh, that uh, may not, uh, probably do want to answer, but in the interest of time, I'm going to go through this, and uh, I know it's an issue that others have raised, and I think it's good that we just face these issues uh, straight on. So this one comes from David McBeth. In, uh, in early COVID-19 announcement, the Wuhan noodle outlet was identified and its business uh, impacted through discrimination. The city of Markham endorsed and promoted residents to support and continue patronage of Chinese uh, uh, restaurants in, uh, in the city. Uh, the promotion was uh, endorsed by other regional communities which effectively promoted uh, or effectively um, used the promotion across the region. And uh, I would just say that, um, yes, there was uh, a couple of things. And I want to clarify this. Um, when uh, I was out uh, promoting restaurants and the shopping, uh, it was to help uh, an industry that certainly had felt the impact. And at the time, and, you know, we can certainly go back and, and uh, show you the statements. At the time, we were advised by public health officials uh, that the risk was very low in, in um, catching the virus and statements like people that were the most vulnerable had to be the most careful, people who were elderly, people who had underlying health conditions. And so, uh, yes, we were trying to help an industry that was impacted, but it was based on the public health uh, officials' information at the time. Uh, as we had new information and new insight from those public health officials, I would say that uh, we have worked as hard as anyone to get the information out and actually have been leaders and advocates uh, with the province of Ontario, again, asking them to close down the non-essential businesses. I, I made that very clear as the mayor, uh, asking for the playgrounds and the park amenities to be included in the in the provincial orders so we clear up the ambiguity and have the consistency and uh, I've said and referenced that we're going to have a big debrief when all this is over uh, definitely uh, some of the information that all of us got very early on uh, I hope uh, there, there has been some more thought as to what information is shared with the public and by the way I am on the public record uh, even in the very early days, as saying that I would never criticize anyone for taking what they felt to be necessary precautions to protect themselves uh, and to protect uh, their families. And so uh, absolutely, I was very definitive on that. And I was certainly acting with the information that had been uh, provided. Um, 
and just wanted to, Norm, we covered this, but I'm happy to repeat it. Dr. Kurji is gone, uh, but Barb and Norm, Norm also want to know uh, how many current cases are there in New York region? And as of five o'clock tonight, there were 824 cases in New York region. Unfortunately, across the region, we've had uh, 41 uh, deaths. Um, there are 215 cases in the city of Markham, and uh, we've had 20 people pass away. So half, almost half of the people that passed away from COVID-19 in the region have passed away from the city of Markham, and just a little over half of them came from Mark Haven. We've had 11 uh, people pass away at the Mark Haven uh, Senior Center. And uh, I don't know, Norm and Barb, if you were there at the beginning, uh, but Markham Stouffville Hospital in particular, but Markham Stouffville, uh, Mackenzie Health, uh, which serves uh, Thornhill and the west part of uh, north end of, of Markham as well, and Richmond Hill, uh, between Markham and, and uh, Mackenzie Health, uh, when you take a look at the numbers of people in ICU, uh, that we are definitely a hot spot. And, and, and actually it even goes uh, further north up to South Lake, but definitely Markham, uh, when you take a look, for example, in, in York region right now, these numbers have gone down slightly in the last few days. So that's a positive thing. But uh, more than half of the people in ICU are, are at Markham Stovall Hospital uh, with all the other numbers that are at the other hospitals. And when you compare that, uh, with other hospitals across the GTA, uh, our ICU unit at Markham Stovall certainly has seen the stress, as Mackenzie Health has as well, and, and South Lake from time to time as well. Um, just, uh, and um, Norm, again, if you weren't here at the beginning, part of our increase in Markham in, in York Region was because of the 37 positive uh, COVID cases for residents at Participation House and another 13 of the staff members. Uh, again, we got those results uh, today. Um, so I think uh, for the wrap up here, Andy, I'm going to turn it over to you and certainly I can pitch in, uh, but what is the long-term impact to the city of Markham and to the region uh, if this lockdown approach continues for the foreseeable future, and again, um, busy dealing with participation house today, but I believe it did pass in the legislature, provincial legislature, the, uh, the restrictions will apply, I believe, to mid-May. If anybody was watching it live, I don't know, but uh, that's been extended. But perhaps you could mention uh, sort of what the impact is. You've covered it but uh, particularly if this uh, goes by, and then perhaps I'll deal with, and if you could just touch on this one, what would a gradual opening of businesses and schools and municipal buildings look like, recognizing that some of these areas are in someone else's jurisdiction and not necessarily ours. But you deal with that, and then I'll deal with the last question related to the use of uh, our military. Okay, Mayor, uh, obviously nobody, as I mentioned previously, has a crystal ball, but it looks like we all know this is a serious economic event. Just today, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, has forecasted for Canada a, co uh, a contraction of 6.2% this year, which is 2020, followed by some growth in 2021. So that's a, that's a steep cliff in 2020. So it's a very sudden, dramatic recession. Uh, in 2020. However, they're looking at the economy picking up somewhat in 2021. But again, that's speculation. But definitely, there's a very severe recession currently and for the balance of 2020. With regards to Markham and the region, the economic damage, well, we'll be reporting Markham, the corporation of Markham. Uh, there's obviously larger community effects monthly to council and our first one will be April or our second one will be April 20th. But the uh, York region 
is uh, convening a uh, committee, which will be made up of all the local municipalities, York Region, the Chamber of Commerces, the Boards of Trades, York Region Business Coalition, Venture Lab, a lot of other um, organizations. We'll look at basically three things, the economic impact assessment, uh, streamlining our business advisory support to a lot of the smaller businesses, business community participation. So the teams have started looking at the assessment of what will be the impact on the uh, local economy, both Markham and York Region. But definitely I'm not going to uh, give numbers tonight, but obviously you can see the IMF have come out with quite a dire prediction today for Canada uh, for the balance of 2020. We're seeing an uptick in 2021, but let's, so we're in here. We're in this for at least the midterm to the long term as a uh, a real slow recovery, based on uh, I guess the timing to get a vaccine when people will be comfortable working, socializing again. With regards to your second question, Mayor, what would a gradual opening of business schools and municipal, and municipal buildings look like? Well, we'll obviously do now, as we are learning more about recovery, it won't be this on off switch. It'll have to be done in close collaboration with our partners at the province, the government of Canada, and, and based on solid science from our public health officials. We don't anticipate um, It'll be business as usual for a long time. Uh, but we are doing now, we'll continue to create and working on what does this new normal look like for our different business units and indeed our staff and uh, employees' lives. Again, as I keep saying, I don't have a crystal ball, but we're definitely working on scenarios and a phased in approach, bringing us back to, I'm not gonna say business as usual or the old normal, I'm gonna say something different, looking at phases to a new normal. We'll have to start describing that to our community and to council. So we're all on the same page because we do want at some point to get people to come back to work in schools in one form or another, but it will be gradual in my opinion, in the opinion of a lot of others. So we have to work with our partners, other levels of government and figure this out collectively. So stay tuned, it's a uh, complex issue in Markham, in Ontario, and across the world. Uh, I also just want to add that um, uh, Destination Markham, uh, which is uh, our uh, tourism board, I'll just use that as a, as a reference, uh, they will be meeting uh, this week and uh, through uh, council, uh, we were asking them to take on uh, developing a marketing plan um, and certainly look to support uh, the hotel industry, the restaurant and hospitality industry, uh, among other things. And they will be, once they have a chance to meet and talk, I know they'll also be reaching out to the Markham Board of Trade and to the BIAs and other uh, business associations as well. But I, I think, uh, you know, obviously, it's going to go well beyond our uh, our efforts. Uh, I think that report, um, again, uh, just sort of hearing it, not necessarily in detail, also alluded to that we're going to need stimulus uh, projects to help kick the economy uh, again. And so this goes beyond just uh, what the city uh, can do. Um, Councillor Keyes, uh, thank you. Uh, you passed on a, a question from one of your residents in relation to our people allowed to visit condominiums. And uh, so a bit of a tricky one. Uh, each condo board d does have its own set of rules and they've been, I think, trying to communicate that to their residents. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, whether you live um, in a rental, whether you live in your own home, whether you live in a single family home, a townhouse or a condominium, we should all be adhering to self isolation. And so unless it's like a medical issue, unless of course a senior uh, needs groceries or supplies dropped off, 
we really are trying to minimize that the interaction between uh, people in the community. And so uh, I just, again, I think everyone has done so well, uh, you know, and uh, so check obviously if there's an absolute need to go visit someone, check with the, that resident to see what the board of that condominium has told them in terms of visitors. And secondly, I would only do it only out of necessity, and that's to help someone get groceries or, or medical supplies or whatever else they, they might need. So I hope that answers uh, in large part the, uh, the question and, uh, and uh, hopefully you know, we'd also have follow-up. Uh, members of council, this really was meant for the public. We are going to have meetings coming up. I, I see that a couple of you have put up your hands and unless someone has someone from a resident that just didn't quite uh, uh, get in, um, uh, definitely um, you know, appreciate uh, all of your efforts in letting people know about this tonight. And other than a bit of a rough start, uh, technically at the beginning, and maybe a couple of bumps uh, along the way. Uh, I think it's worked out quite well. And uh, please, uh, happy to get your feedback later this week. And, and also from residents and businesses, if you were listening in, uh, please uh, email us, let you know what you think. If you think we should do this again, happy to convey a bit of an update. And uh, I like the informality of it. Uh, it lets us speak uh, honestly and, and truthfully and deal with issues uh, right up front. And uh, I have found the time to be uh, very useful. And uh, as we've always said, we will get through this together. A reminder of a couple of things. You can get links at markham.ca forward slash COVID-19. You'll see the areas of responsibilities for the different levels of government. And you will have the links there to get to some of the programs that were referenced tonight. If you see an abuse, a flagrant abuse of all the restrictions that have been put in place. The non-emergency number, please do not call 911, but the non-emergency number for York Regional Police is 1-866-876-5423. Thank you to all of our no frills, to Longos, to Whole Foods, to Food Basics across the city of Markham. Uh, the, when you're out shopping, I uh, appreciate that, that there, there's different challenges we're all facing, but if you can drop uh, some items into the boxes in the stores uh, for the Markham Food Bank, uh, I know they would continue to appreciate that. And please, if any of you have masks or any uh, personal protective equipment that you'd like to uh, and look at if you want to donate directly to Mackenzie Health or if you want to donate directly to Markham Stovall Hospital or to one of the other institutions go ahead and do that this was not meant to stop that uh, but what it is meant to do is to avoid what we had on the weekend when, when someone uh, in that particular case participation house was running out of uh, some of their supplies, certainly not all of them, but some of them. And we wanted to make sure that that was not a reason for the workers to be concerned about that there wasn't enough equipment. But we literally had to scramble. There was an amazing response, but it, I don't think we should have to do it that way. So if we can keep some at our, at our Markham Cares Donation Center, so when organizations need it, they can get to it. Again, uh, thank you to... Uh, to all of uh, the um, members of council, to our staff, and to the healthcare workers, you are our heroes. So thank you, good night to everybody, and stay healthy. Thank you very much.